I want someone to say like action. <laughs> <laughs> Hi and welcome to iScience Coffee and Chat. Uh, this is the show where we uh, engage experts here at Imperial and get to have a quick and informal discussion with them. Uh, I'm Jamie and I'm joined this week by Wendy Barkley, hi, uh, professor here at Imperial in Influenza. Um, she recently had her paper published in Nature for the first time and we're really excited to get to grips with exactly what she's working on and studying. So uh, hi Wendy, can you um, give us the first kind of induction into uh, exactly your field and within it what your speciality sure. is? So um, I'm an influenza virologist, so I study influenza virus which causes colds and flu. Uh, but the aspect I'm really interested in is uh, whether or not we're going to have new, more pandemics of influenza. Pandemics come around every 10 years or so and that's when the virus jumps from birds into humans and then learns to spread, transmit amongst humans through the air. So um, I've brought along a few things to explain to you how that all works. <laughs> I just got those. So um, this is a little flu virus or this is what flu virus is supposed to look like, a ball of nucleic acid in the middle there, its genome, and then all these spikes on the outside. And I'm going to represent the, the virus by these little ping pong balls, which have got bits of Velcro on them, um, just to sort of explain to you that basically all viruses have to enter cells. So they, they, we breathe them in, and then they roll down our throats, and they bind onto cells, and then they have to get inside cells yeah. in order to replicate. And it's really important that the virus is able to latch on securely to cells uh, in our noses and throats if it's going to actually be successful pathogen in humans. So we know that human viruses have got really good match. Their little bits of Velcro stick very nicely to the cells that line our noses and throats. But we know that bird flu viruses have got a problem there if they want to jump into humans and, and infect us because their, their stickiness for human uh, noses and throats is much less. The receptors aren't a good match. Right. So although they can occasionally stick, uh, they, they often just fall off again. So we're really interested in in that and how that limits the virus's ability to really become a human problem and, and transmit amongst us. And we're also interested in this process of transmission um, in thinking about how does it actually work and how many of these, these viruses come out from one person through the air and make it into the next person in order to establish the next infection. Because that has a big impact on the way the virus evolves yeah. and flu evolution is really important. That's why every year we have to update the flu vaccine and make a new one. Yeah, absolutely, which, which is, I guess, incredibly expensive and a massive drain on resources. Um, so in your recent paper in Nature, um, sure. what, what have you found? What, what's been going so, on? So the recent paper in Nature was um, all about what happens next. So after right. the virus is actually bound to the surface of the cells, it kind of goes inside the cell, and then it has to take over the cell's machinery, co-opting various host factors to help itself replicate. And um, what we discovered was that bird flu viruses are kind of mismatched with the machinery that's inside human or mammalian cells. Uh, they're, they're obviously evolved to work really well in bird cells and over millions of years of co-evolution, the bird flu virus has learned to utilize a particular protein which is subtly different in birds than it is in all mammals. And um, that's really exciting because we know that that protein is absolutely essential to support the efficient replication of the virus inside cells. Um, we can see that, that the difference between birds and humans is defined at the level of this protein and we all also can hypothesize that if we can make a small molecule that interferes with the virus's ability to utilize that protein then that might be a really good new antiviral target. Fantastic. And so, uh, as we discussed I think a little bit earlier, we'd um, been looking at that and the idea of having uh, a small molecular interference effectively between the virus and the, the host protein, you're effectively targeting an interaction with um, your a human a human's pro, uh, proteins they need for their own benefit. So, yeah. what are the risks associated with that? Yes, I mean, of course, these proteins are not there in our cells so that we can get infected by flu. They're there to do an important job for the host cell and keep us alive. So we can't design drugs that completely block those proteins' functions. Otherwise, we're going to have some horrible side effects. Um, with flu, it might be possible to target such host cell proteins because influenza infections are very short-lived in comparison to some other viruses. So when a person gets infected with flu, the virus is only in their body for six or seven days. So even if, that, if, even if our hypothetical drug yeah. does have some side effects, it might still be tolerated, particularly in severe cases of flu. But nonetheless, the, the ideal 
scenario would be to understand exactly how the virus is co-opting the, the host protein and interfere very specifically with that molecular interaction and hope that we don't mess up what the protein's other job is in, in the healthy cell. Okay, absolutely fantastic. And so I, I remember there was one example of how exactly you knew you'd come to the right protein and the right interaction. Yeah. Um, what, what was that? So that's the story of the ostriches. Um, so it turns out that although we think of ostriches as birds, influenza virus sees ostriches more like mammals. So we know that because where there have been instances of ostriches becoming infected with bird flu, we see that the virus won't grow in the ostrich cells unless it undergoes exactly the same kinds of mutations that we see happening when viruses adapt to humans or pigs and other mammals. And so that told us that whatever this mystery protein that we've been searching for for decades was, it must be similar in ostriches, more similar between the ostrich and the human than between ostriches and other birds. And when we discovered our protein um, and, and started looking at this, the equivalent proteins in lots of different species, we were really excited uh, to find that our protein in ostriches is more like humans than it is like birds. So that was the point at which we sort of jumped up and down in the air and got very excited and decided that we discovered the, the, the real host factor which defines this host species barrier. Okay, well fantastic and congratulations again for the publication in Nature thank you. and thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, you can find Wendy's paper and for Nature online, find it in the video description underneath this video. Uh, otherwise you can follow us uh, at iScience at iScienceMag uh, at Twitter. You find, again you'll find the link underneath in the description. That's all for us this week, thanks so much for joining. Thanks. Okay. Very good. It must be intimidating when we're both here like. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about you.